you just have observed as a, from the panel and presenters is an existence theorem that uh, this field is morphing from science into technology into business, which is a sure feedback sign that the science is improving and getting better too. Okay, I've also decided that I uh, don't think I'm going to make being a moderator as a as a uh, next career for me. <laughs> and uh, but I do want the panel to come join us. We do have a hard stop at 6:30, and uh, I do want to hit a few key questions that'll be fun to cover from what we've seen and heard. Uh, as they're seated, I'm going to start literally with uh, Lloyd and uh, with Paul, the last two presenters. Uh, and, you know, the enthusiasm of entrepreneurs is unbounded. I don't, Steve's still with us. That's good. So he's very happy and smiling. <laughs> and anyone who comes up with a way to suppress the enthusiasm, which nobody wants, i.e. limit the amount of time, let us all know about it. Anyway, that was sensational, guys. Let's start with your point. You guys, the last two speakers, the last two companies, both in the neuroscience and in the technology sense, work with senses. Surprise, surprise. Evolution you know, hundreds of millions of years, what did that start off? It started off with sensory transducers. And sensory transducers moved into pre-processing, and pre-processing ultimately through thalamus and cortex and so on. So the point really is, 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 is kind of twofold. Are, when do we think that things like artificial retinas, artificial cochlea, serenos, enos will be realized? And are those, is that the path? In other words, the path can have killer apps in other directions, and the science can take it in other ways, cognitively, as James Anderson was talking about, if a device that gave cognitive and decision-making things could happen. So will the evolution of machines happen the same or differently as the evolution of, of us here today? Uh, why don't we start with Lloyd and Paul and then move to the rest of the panel. Um, shall, shall I begin? Please. Um, <laughs> Well, like I said, there's, there's a lot of different approaches, and uh, it's clear that the direction that I'm pursuing is going in the direction of starting with sensory Understood. processing. However, um, I see a lot of activity indicating other ways to begin, uh, search engine approaches, um, other, other kinds of devices. So um, I would say it's, it's going to be a war that advances on many fronts, including that one. Great. Okay. Paul? Well, I think the answer to the first question is that we've seen a product. Uh, Lloyd just demonstrated a product that certainly impressed me that is based on uh, the synthesis of very neural circuitry, uh, not in an academic abstract sense, but taking a very academic uh, body of knowledge and putting it to work in the real world. So, so there is al already a product. I would say that our group will have a prototype that I could take to Safeway and go down the vegetable and fruit aisle, next to a cantaloupe and a banana, in the presence of background with the variation in concentration, which makes that problem hard and which you may have noted makes it in some way analogous to uh, identifying Ella Fitzgerald's voice in the presence mm -hmm. of her background. Mm -hmm. uh, so the products that are based on sensory machines are already here in Lloyd's case will be here soon. The question that I think is provocative is what then find? I think that's 1.0. I think 1.0 is already emerging. Mm -hmm. What's 1.0? One, what's the next step where you have uh, not just primary sensory recognition of the most basic sort, uh, but where you uh, have a second order processing step and uh, w with which you gain a deeper knowledge, it's something that may, be, may involve a prediction of uh, where you are, wh what the context is, what's going to happen next, uh, things that I think are related to Jeff and Delip's uh, more abstract efforts. So I think, I think the answer is that devices can already be built, are already being built. And at the next conference, or the conference after, I hope that we'll see the next layer. Two questions come out of that. Steve, I'm glad you're taking the mic. Where do you see the killer apps going to come from? We're all interested in hearing that. Neural circuits, first applications, and also are large companies going to reinvent themselves in this area, or is it only going to be the little guys which you uh, duly support and are interested in that are really going to make the initial breakthroughs. Sure, and, and I want to also build up uh, Paul's point, <clears throat> but I'll take the, the, the 
softball first. Of course, it'll be the little guys. It always has been and always will. Um, for any disruptive change, that is. Uh, non hey, <laughs> I tried, Dilip. I tried. I mean, I tried the mentor. For the disruptive change. For the disruptive change. Not all big opportunities, but those that will uh, uh, re-engineer re the playing field. Um, but segue, and I'll try to get to your question about the opportunities. I, there's one intuitive way in which I reacted to your comments and your first question, which was that when you look at uh, the sensory systems as a place to start, one of the reasons I think it intuitively is the best place to start is it's the interface. And, and it comes back to that evolutionary framework I was talking about, that when you have a complex system of some sort, it's the interface that's usually the area of, of keen um, friction with economies and market opportunities. So this is a pattern I saw in nanotech projects. It's a pattern we've seen in a number of areas that even if you could build something that is marvelous, be it a molecular assembler, be it an artificial intelligence, the, the challenge is how do you interface the economy as we know it, the world as we know it, and products we care about today. And there are places where you can couple directly to our biology, and there's places you can couple, um, I guess, theoretically, uh, with the sensory, uh, sensory motor cortex. So I think it just naturally is that's where you start. And then just like we recapitulate the, uh, the evolution of biological systems, you start with that and then move to higher level abstractions with similar constructs. Um, an even more bizarre analogy can be drawn to the uh, chip industry itself moving over the last 10 to 20 years from a logic-centric, almost reptilian kind of reflex orientation where logic and speed is what mattered to a memory-saturated architecture today. Right? If you look at an Intel Pentium, it is over 95% memory by transistor, right? the chips that you buy that you think of as logic chips. They've run out of in innovative gas, if you will, on the, on the limbic side, and now they're just saturating with memory. It's, it's a, a fascinating comparison. And so I think you'll see a similar thing about bearing out. So the questions of applications, you know, I, I think it's going to play out exactly like you've seen. Entrepreneurs lead the way. They have much more collective wisdom than any investor could. Uh, and so we look to them to inspire us rather than think that we know the answers. But so I can have, make a short-term, highly confident prediction that the sensory systems, be that olfactory, vision, and auditory, will be the near-term opportunities. And that will take a good five to ten years mm -hmm. to realize their sure. full potential. So, so the audience has people, and as well as the panel, that are uh, – potential entrepreneurs. How do they approach the venture capital world, presumably angel round people? How and when does that happen? It sounds like it's not too early, although some of the companies up here have obviously been going for quite a while. Do you think it's good to go? Well, it, depends. it, it differs a lot by context. I, the sure. only generalization I'd make is that the comment you heard from Lloyd is spot on, that investors, you know, they're, they're the short attention span theater. And, uh, you know, three to five years <laughs> is really pushing their uh, limits. You know, yeah. I, I like to think long term, but it's translated to um, sort of guiding principles about industries to look at and opportunities to pursue and visions of entrepreneurs. But the businesses we invest in need to have a path to revenue with customers within a three to five year horizon max. Um, and usually they have this conundrum of how can I engage with customers and grow my way to a huge future opportunity. So, you know, the big, bold vision is important, the 20-year vision, the 100-year vision even in some cases, but that can't be the business plan. Uh, there has to be some stepping right. stone along the way. Tony, how do you see the impact on brain science? In other words, this, this technology app, and please all of you uh, comment because you all come from the brain science research community. How does that flip back? Are there benefits? Do you really get stuff on the brain science end that you learn and happens from what's happening as the technology goes out? Um, <laughs> I think my answer to that question is a little subversive with Wait respect to some of the other speakers. <laughs> okay. But, I mean, you know, I worked with Lloyd at Interval. He was uh, right next door. We used to have lots of uh, interesting arguments and discussions. Many things we agree on, but I think there's really something that I disagree with him on. I think the timeline of 2025, the time when we will have human capacity marches forward at the on average at the rate of time, and we never get there. And uh, the reason is that and what we do get is we get faster and faster computers, and we get um, you know, really you know, much more uh, whizzy demos and things like that. But there's an understanding barrier um, which has not been crossed, and, um, and every time we try to defend, you know, really build source separation machines, things like that, that I've, I've also worked on, um, you run into a, basically technical problems in machine learning. And you, there's two ways you can go. You can go and try and solve those technical problems and try to understand how the biological system does it. Or you, you can um, you know, do quite a lot of clever hacking, hacking with existing theory. Um, for example, Bayesian belief propagation on trees is well understood. So we can build inference engines um, such as Dalip is doing for, um, for feed-forward pattern recognition of images. Um, but but um, belief propagation in loops, its connection to um, underlying learning, because the inference and learning are different problems in, in, in uh, machine learning. 
and the um, and the, the sensory motor problems and the building of hierarchical representations such as what's needed to spec to truly in a self-organized way segment the spectrogram the way Lloyd is showing. All of these things are things which we've been banging our heads on for 15 years, 20 years, however longer, I don't know. Um, and we need, we need to really make some mathematical breakthroughs to, to really turn this thing in a different direction. That doesn't mean that the kind of work that's being presented is not going to produce workable products because a lot of theory exists. And it doesn't mean that these things are all hacks, it, you know, but certain component of it is. Um, so the lesson which I've learned from moving a little bit towards applications and then back again to theory is that you know, we, we, we can't put a time on whenever AI will be made. And, and there's really some understanding of the biology, which fundamental mathematical understanding of the biology, which needs to be done first. Dalit, let me flip a question to you. Obviously, Jeff founding Numenta and you guys founding Numenta was a, a, a well-funded operation. And to Tony's point, I happen to completely agree, breakthrough technology, uh, good technology wraps around great science or the reverse. And it takes a hell of a lot longer than people think. I don't know one technology I've ever worked with where people think it was a year or two or three. It was about 10, every single one of them that I had mentioned. So where are you, if I ask you from a business plan point of view, from real progress, from revenue coming out, where does the world of business, which is a nonlinear and complex combination of human beings and technology, where are you guys now and how is that happening? Okay, uh, first I have to say that we, we are not concentrated on building human level intelligence. Okay, we, we, we have a route where we think interesting applications can be built with our existing technology. So we, we don't, we don't uh, it's not about uh, like language understanding, for example. It's, it's, for example, with our existing technology, we can model spatiotemporal processes. And there are existing, like, interesting applications to be done there. But that doesn't mean we, we don't push the te envelope of the technology. We will keep pushing the envelope of the technology while building these interesting applications. But not necessarily based on where Jeff originally came from, which was core brain science theory as he postulated it? So, uh, core, necessarily? Bra core brain science theory still goes on. Okay. Um, and at the, Numenta. At Numenta. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but as we don't build systems which are uh, like to the like for example we don't build spiking neuron systems and because we haven't found a need to and when when we find a need if if we see that we at some level like some aspect of our recognition system cannot be achieved without spiking neurons we will so we it's it's on a need basis we are doing it we like we decide to stop our abstraction at, at some level and that's uh, like when we see that something cannot be done without it. So far we haven't seen it and we are not building okay, it. So you. that doesn't mean we are not doing brain science. We are doing it at some level. Okay, well, well the business part of the plan, since like of another question or two, I'd like to join into that. So uh, one thing we, we seem to be on the verge of putting together whole brain simulations at a mouth scale, not bad. Do you see a path to market for the approach? And again, what do you think is going to come out of these things in terms of from the simulations into the brain science end, if anyone wants to pick up on that and comment. Uh, okay, my, my, so when I look at these experiments, uh, I'm baffled in the sense that I, I get confused about what to derive from that. That's my personal opinion because uh, I, I go into something with a uh, hypothesis. Like I go into an experiment uh, as a hypothesis, hypothesis testing uh, process. I don't go free of hypothesis. So it's, it's my personal opinion that I, like, but, but clearly the scientists working on those experiments know what they're doing. And they have their own hypothesis and they know what to derive from it. But I don't. So I, uh, I, I uh, won't as much address the, uh, the, the fascinating mouse level blue gene simulation that Darmendra showed us yesterday. I don't understand it well enough. It was really the first time I've seen it. Uh, and I uh, look forward to visiting there and learning more about it. What I would say, though, is that uh, there is a fascinating field uh, that's fairly well developed that uh, many of us may not be aware of that I think uh, can fuse with our field to uh, take us to the next step in precognition. Forget about cognition. Mm -hmm. Evolutionary robotics, uh, which started in the early 90s, late 80s uh, in uh, England, 
uh, is, is a, uh, a branch of computer science or engineering, if you will, where you have uh, a system either virtual or real with sensors and motor effectors and some inner neuron system, uh, the connections of which evolve. It's placed in a either virtual or real sensory motor environment and given a fitness uh, function, meaning you uh, chase light and you avoid obstacles or you, you know, the, you, you, you'd make some definition that uh, uh, corresponds to its survival. And you then have an evolutionary algorithm to alter the sensor properties, the effector properties, and the connection properties. Now, the, the weakness of that field, in my view, I think is terribly promising for the, our way forward. The weakness of it is that they use non-neural components. It's neural like a neural network is neural. You've got connections and simple sigmoid nodes, and that's, and that's the system. Um, what we're going to do, what we believe is the way forward, is to take that approach with a sensory motor uh, uh, a creature in a virtual or real sensory motor environment uh, with some, some uh, goal, you know, to, to find food and to avoid, um, and avoid uh, uh, things that are, are uh, bad for it in the presence of obstacles. Uh, it, it may be that that kind of a framework would allow uh, the emergence of the sensory motor coordination that really underlies intelligence. Not with cognition, but maybe with a secondary association area in the sensory front end, which is another layer past where, where we are, and maybe a premotor or motor area. Uh, I, could see, I could see systems like that. I, I, can't, I can't say that's the only approach, but I would advocate that as a fruitful approach that we're equipped to, to put in our sites now. Many of the, the comments that uh, we're hearing and discussing seem to go to the issue of what I see happening now over the next three to five years and has been going on of what a lot of people call augmented con cognition. In other words, let's augment the human being with computing capabilities, tools, additional sensing and enhance. And then on the flip side, you go out 50 years with Kurzweil saying right, wrong, and different, that we become spiritual machines and machines will surpass humans. Anybody want to comment further on that? I won't even call it a dichotomy. It may be a continuous stream. But I'm looking for some comments on the notion of what we seem to see emerging now and what some people think is going to be, I would say, only 50 years toward, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, a spiritual machine or whatever. Anyone further want to comment on that? Steve, you seem to be nodding your head, so you got caught. <laughs> it sounded like you had something to say. I mean, I, I think there's obviously a number of neuronal implants that are already well underway, from the cochlear implant to a lot of research. Uh, but, well, the, the BMI guy, he's not here anymore, is he? Uh, our panelist. Yeah, he had to leave. Uh, that's, oh, that's right. Okay, so yeah, he had to leave. He, he would have been obviously the, the best person. Yes, to he speak would to have that. been. I have a few pretty, questions on pretty BMI. Pretty amazing <laughs> work that we saw there with, uh, with the yep. primates. Um, and obviously, because of the, the plasticity that one has in the, uh, uh, in the representation of those inputs, it's sort of a natural place to hijack, and, and, the, and the human mind is obviously, and it, I'm, I'm, I mean, you guys know this better than, than I do, has a remarkable ability to welcome these uh, prosthetic extensions to oneself. And so, you know, whether it's, you know, medical research to start or, or military-funded research, um, I think there's a lot of potential there. Does that work migrate? or natural segue, naturally segue into what Kurzweil is talking about. I'm not sure if I see the direct connection um, as clearly. There seems mm -hmm. to be a pretty big leap for, for our non-destructive brain scanning um, that's very different that, that, that would be necessary for Kurzweil's vision to play out. And so, um, you know, I, I think uh, it's more likely the bonobos will be uploaded long before the humans always come back to yeah, that point. Yeah, I think uh, this one, this yeah. take a little bit longer than expected. And Tony, then we'll never look back. <laughs> Tony, uh, go full circle back to you on a, a question which is really at the core, the essence of the conference, and uh, it's very wide-ranging presentations. What do you think future computing system architectures have to gain from insights from brain science down to the neuronal and molecular levels? Again, it's kind of a reformulation of the same question. I know something you're interested in. You might want to pass the ball to somebody else, but it certainly joins two very major issues that we saw presented here today. Right, so um, I guess this, this question relates to um, uh, molecular computing and smart matter and things like that. Like I think, I think that um, material science research nowadays is very interesting, and I know there's some of that happening at IBM. Um, if I was uh, advising somebody to what to do for uh, something for f in 30 or 40 years' time, not in three or four, I would be trying to break that uh, Turing 
cutoff level and to get um, use the functionality at the bottom. So we've got these things called quantum computers which operate in the wave function. We've got the Turing computers operating on the bit state vector. There's a, there's a lot of intermediate structure which is essentially what's spanned between uh, the atomic level and um, the cellular level. Um, um, so, and, and, and what is the capacity of that? I don't think you can say that in 20 years' time we will have human capacity because nobody can measure the density information processing, effective information processing happening in the cytoplasm. But, um, and so I, I tend to um, agree more with Steve that, um, um, that it's going to be a bottom-up. You, you're never going to get... Um, you're never going to get it if you cut off at the bottom, right? But it is going to be bottom up and top down because we can always put boundary conditions on things. You can, you know, we're going to have out of control machines, but we have in control humans, right? So we're probably going to control the machines the same way that we control the humans, which is by television or something like that. <laughs> um, so, but you know, in the end, you know, for the good of the, the forward movingness of life, they're going to just end up being part of life, and, and that's it. I don't see it as a you know, Schwarzenegger scary scenario necessarily. It's just, but we've, you know, to do that, we've got to do that four billion years of search in some way, or else download it from the genome, because that's been four billion years of parallel combinatorial search to yeah. produce the bag of proteins shapes that works well together, and the, and and that's really what's what's you know that, and the, even the physics beneath that is what's driving our capacity. Yeah. And I, I think, think it's right. deluded it. to 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 say that. Um, that, you know, um, you know, Kurzweil talks about the neural features as if they're like four or five things that we can write down, but th th those things are fictions. Yeah, the brain science and the technology don't necessarily equate even though they look good. Uh, Paul, comment, and then I want to put two last questions on the table for one reason. As people peel off to reception or whatever, with a comment, Lloyd, if you're going to have Ella up there for investors, my only suggestion, because that was sensational, some wine has to go with it, okay? Except that they may invest the investor in the, in the entertainment. Uh, Paul, comment, and then I'll put two on the table to start, and then everyone can continue discussing it later. I know we have to clear out. I'm, I'm, going, to, uh, I'm going to break the pattern. Uh, first of all, I'm going to let Jerry know that your car is going to be waiting now, Yes, I've got a problem. And you may want right. another flight. Um, my, I, I'm going to pose a question to Lloyd because uh, I want to I want to get his take on something that we've been tossing around, but he hasn't weighed in on yet. If you'll allow me, Jerry, uh, you don't have to tell us. I'm not asking you what audience is going to do next because it's a private company. But you're you're a real student of uh, of, of real biological neural circuitry. You put it to work at let's call it 1.0, which is um, genuine tough sensory processing in the real world. Uh, not something that would be revenue driven, not audience's next quarter's business plan, but if you wanted to, to take a baby step towards cognition, what would your next step be? Actually, that, that's quite an easy one. Uh, we, we do have a product roadmap, and um, what you saw in the, the product demonstration with the two mics and the very simple uh, approach to locking onto the voice that's close to the primary mic. Um, that is a, a very small subset of a much more complex stream separation system that, that we built. Um, the, the product roadmap that we have is, is now basically harvest more of the things that we've already built and productize them. Um, so the, the, the general approach of building a full stream separator and then commercializing that um, has already begun and w we've already got a, a very nice uh, headway already done. So the answer is take your ground, essentially? Yes, yes essentially. Yeah, for locking onto the, the, the key voice uh, without, with, with fewer and fewer constraints. And but is that a step to cognition, or is that just a better acoustic Well, I, I would say in a, in a limited way that it's both. Um, it, it certainly it represents a product advance, a more saleable, more general product. Um, however, the 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 machinery that we had to build for that demonstration, um, in, in, in my opinion, is remarkably advanced. And um, I'm actually uh, I, I'm referring to work that was done by members of my team, Stephen, David Klein. Um, these guys have built a, a functioning stream separator grouper. Um, and in, in fact, it is actually based on uh, machine learning principles, Kalman tracking, um, sensor, sort of sensory fusion across the different representations. Um, 
but I haven't been able to give any visibility into that. But um, the, uh, part of the audience's strategy is to is to do the science and, and try to do it as well as we possibly can, and to to allow that, as our VP of Sales refers to, it, to sort of create this reservoir of technology from which we can then harvest things as as we are mature enough to bring products. Uh, Steve, as, as you well know, the, there's, there's a learning curve to introducing a product. All of your companies have to go through that, and, and we're going through that now, actually supporting cell phone makers, pulling on them with wireless carriers, and dealing with ITU and standards. There's a, there's a whole business learning curve right. as well as developing it. I suggest Lloyd having experienced that and seeing in other companies. That is what a few people mentioned is going to take a huge amount of more time and effort than you'd think that interface. Yes. Anyway, my last question just to, to, to uh, open it up is, and you can't do all of those, you can't do frequently great science in a corporate environment. And it isn't even just quarter, quarterly related or profitability related. That's why universities like this are a major part of the game to have you know, separate goals and so on that are core focus. So as a last question to discuss over wine, is this field either on the neuroscience side or on the computer science side and the convergence that's going on, is it going to happen and grow by evolution or by revolution? In, in the sense that there is certainly going to be step by step, there's certainly going to be breakthroughs, but is an Einstein needed to make the difference? Okay, is there something here going on that you need an Einstein to make the difference, or will it be step by step with brilliant hard working efforts as we all understand? Anybody want to take a crack at that one? I'll um, uh, tell you that. Uh, I, I think that uh, the field is full of revolutions to come, one after the next after the next. Really very little has been accomplished. I mean, let's all face it, all those of us that have pursued the study of computational neuroscience and neurobiology, we know that it's just the very teetering baby steps. Jerry's uh, sponsoring efforts to, get to, to move agree. that forward all over the country. But really, it's the very earliest pre-kindergarten days. And I think that that means that... Uh, the, the the terrific killer demonstrations of neural circuits functioning, uh, one after the next, are going to come, and there's going to be uh, my view is that there's going to be just revolution after revolution, um, of which we've seen very few. But as Steve pointed out, there's an existence proof, or maybe Jerry did that, that we know that neural circuits can do extraordinary things. Watch a hummingbird dart through trees, stop, look, do something, move on. That's a a bean-sized physical circuit, isn't it? So. There will be uh, dramatic revolutions. They, most of them have not yet happened. Let's continue that over one. I want to thank everybody. Hopefully we added some clarity and insight. Oh. <clears throat>